Good morning, Impact Church. Happy Sunday. Way to scare the pastor. Happy Father's Day. <laughs> Happy Father's Day. If everybody could go ahead and stand up, we're going to go ahead and say a little prayer together, and then we're going to begin worshiping together. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much. Thank you for the love that you shed onto each and every one of us. Dear God, thank you for, for providing that model of what the best father could ever be, that unconditional love. I thank you for each and every father and father figure that is here in this building or online today. God, I just ask that you continue to pour your knowledge and your wisdom into each of them so they can continue to just be that guiding figure in their families and friends' lives. God, I am so thankful for each and every person here today. Please just have us to open our hearts and our minds to worship and have us just enjoy everything that today has to offer. In your name we pray, amen. Obviously, y'all can see that by myself today, so I expect you to sing nice and loud. <laughs> Saturday was silent. Surely it was through, but since when has impossible ever stopped you? Friday's disappointment is Sunday's empty tomb, but since when has impossible ever stopped you? This is the sound of dry bones rattling. This is the praise make a dead man walk again. Open the grave, I'm coming out. I'm gonna live, gonna live again. This is the sound of dry bones rattling. Hostile fire, stirring something new, yeah. You're not gonna run out of miracles anytime soon. Resurrection power, it runs in my veins too, yeah. I believe there's another miracle here in this room. This is the sound of dry bones rattling. This is the praise, make a dead man walk again. Open the grave, I'm coming out, I'm gonna live, gonna live again. This is the sound of dry bones rattling. My God is able to save and deliver and heal and restore anything that he wants to just ask the man who was thrown on the bones of elisha if there's anything that he can do just ask the stone that was rolled at the tomb in the garden what happens when God says to move I feel him moving it now I feel him doing it now I feel him doing it now do it now do it now this is the sound of dry bones rattling this is 
go ahead and take just a couple of moments to welcome everybody this morning. are stacked against me I'm surrounded on all sides but I've heard you can part the waters so in your name come and turn the tide I'm staring at this mountain No chance I'm getting through But I've heard they can melt before you So in your name I'm asking it to move Let that break through Miracle power pour out. I need a breakthrough. Miracle moment right now. Only in you and with you. My victory is found. Bring that breakthrough. Miracle power. Let it rain. The fires around are raging. I feel the heat at every turn. But I've heard that you're in it with me. So now by faith, I'm standing on your word. In your name, I know I.
cross stands before me. It is finished, it is done. But I heard you till death was over. So in your name, I'll claim this fight is won. burden for too long on my own I wasn't created to bear it alone I hear your invitation to let it all go I see it now I'm laying it down. I know that I need you. I run to the Father. I fall into grace. I'm done with the hiding, no reason to wait. My heart needs a surgeon. My soul needs a friend. So I'll run to the Father again and again and again and again. Oh, 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 oh. You saw my condition, had a plan from the start. Your son for redemption, the price from the heart. And I don't have a context for that kind of love. I don't understand, I can't comprehend, all I know is Father, I fall into grace. I'm done with the hiding, no reason to wait. My heart needs a surgeon, my soul needs a friend. So I run to the Father again and again and again and again. Oh.
had to have a healing service right here. <laughs> that really, have you ever pinched your finger? Like, you know what I mean? Like, that really hurts. Christy said, she said, oh, is that a bad word? <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, I wasn't laughing at her. I was laughing with her. You know what I mean? There's a difference, right? Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Impact. It is good to see all of your smiling faces this morning. That's a key to those of you who are not yet smiling to go ahead and put a smile on. Turn that frown upside down is what they say. Uh, it takes less muscles to, to smile than it does to frown. So why waste energy, right? Uh, is the older I get, the, I guess the, the more I realize that it's, uh, it's about being smarter. You know, um, somebody said to me the other day, why are you doing it that way? I said, because dad told me a long time, work smarter, not harder. And uh, Kathy's like, we wrote, so let me tell you this. So if you ride with me and we go somewhere to a store or something like that, I'm going to ride around until I find a parking spot that's close. Okay? And Kathy, the other day we went to a store and Kathy said, God forbid we'd have to park one row over. I was like, well, you know, um, I know who has to go get the car. When that, that, did the rainstorm come through here? Kathy and I were in Ocean City uh, the other night when that thing, and she's like, go get the car. I was like, no, uh <laughs> uh-uh. order another appetizer. We're not going anywhere. <laughs> but it is good to see all of your smiling faces out this morning. Welcome to Impact. Those of you who are joining us on Facebook Live or YouTube, we want to welcome you as well. It is good to be in the Father's house, is it not? And uh, we want to celebrate and recognize all of our men here today. Uh, whether you're a father or not, you are a father figure, and uh, we liken ourselves to the one and only father, the father uh, of God, our father. So let's recognize our men this morning. Happy Father's Day. Yeah, yeah, it's good stuff. And uh, somebody, I was reading some quotes this week, and they were like, so why is it on Mother's Day all the churches plan all these special gifts for the mothers and, and have these little things, and, and they, don't, they don't really do anything for Father's Day. And I was like, well, you know, guys really don't care. <laughs> it, it, you, know, uh, if, you know, if you get up and on Father's Day and somebody cooks you breakfast or takes you out to lunch, man, that's a, that, that's a nice day, you know what I mean? No honeydew honey, honey list on Father's Day. Okay, you ladies, no honeydew lists. All right, okay, Jen, <laughs> leave Michael alone, all right, but uh, we, we're glad to have you here this morning. We got a lot of things going on and a lot of things coming up. Uh, let me make mention real quick that next week, uh, am I correct, next Sunday after the service, uh, we will be having our uh, Vacation Bible School meeting. Uh, as you probably saw, the sign is up out front, July 25th through the 28th. We'll be holding Vacation Bible School here. It's going to be called Kingdom Seekers, and uh, we're excited about that. Again, partnering with our church and uh, looking to tell our community and our children about Jesus Christ, and I think it's going to be a great time. So uh, if there's any uh, questions about that, you can contact Jen. Uh, her number's there on your bulletin, uh, or you can email her at uh, waves at impactfruitland.org, and uh, we'll, we'll make sure that that takes place. I'm sure the registration's online, and uh, so things, we're getting geared up, getting ready to go on Vacation Bible School. It's always a good time to see all those kids. Uh, one of the things that we're going to be doing this year that we've done in the past, maybe didn't do it last year, but we're going to do it again this year, is uh, we're going to be giving away uh, a special a prize to somebody on the Sunday following Vacation Bible School. Um, uh, we're thinking bicycles, don't you think? Uh, I think nice new bike would be good. Uh, so, you know, for, the, for a little girl and a little guy. Now, there's going to be some prerequisites to that, like you're going to earn points during the week. So if you're coming to Vacation Bible School, make sure you bring your Bible. Make sure you learn your Bible verse. Uh, bring a friend. Bring a friend. That's going to count a lot. Bring a friend, and uh, we're going to give you extra points for that. And then on that Sunday, uh, we're going to give away a couple bicycles. So we're excited about that. Don't forget Wednesday nights uh, here at the church. 
Uh, Pastor Rob is, uh, is leading our, our small group there, our Bible study, and then again on Sunday mornings at 8.30. Uh, if you can't make it out on Wednesday nights, come see Pastor Rob again on Wednesday, or Sunday mornings at 8.30, and uh, I believe you're studying the book of Genesis, correct? And on Sunday mornings, so that's good. And uh, how many of you like the new chairs? Are they comfortable? Huh? Yeah. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I, I sat in one this week, and I'm like, oh, they're not biting the back of my leg like those old ones used to. That's just for us bigger guys, okay? Some of you all didn't have to worry about that, but they really got me like right there. And uh, we're thankful to have those and uh, looking forward to a great time uh, today. So it is Father's Day, and uh, let's just open up this morning with a word of prayer. Can we do that? Father, we come to you this morning. This is Father's Day, where all across the world uh, we are recognizing, celebrating those men who have uh, been so instrumental and so uh, vibrant and uh, important in our lives. But God, we would be remiss this morning if we didn't recognize you first, because you are Abba Father. You are God Creator. You are the one who loved us so much that you were willing to give up your own son on the cross of Calvary that we might have the promise of eternal life. So Father, we come to you this morning thanking you for the privilege and the honor of being here. We ask, Lord, that you meet with us here today as we will be speaking uh, from your word about the qualities of a godly father. And God, uh, we thank you for all the men here, uh, Lord, that uh, whether they've had children or not, they can still be that, that father figure to so many of our children today and in our world. So God, now meet with us today. Uh, Lord, you know what we need. As uh, the song said, we run to you this morning. Our hearts need a surgeon, Lord. We need, we need you to work in our lives. And so we're asking right now for the power and the working of the Holy Spirit to come into this place today. Settle among us as we learn and as we decipher and as we absorb uh, that which is being spoken to this morning through your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen? All right, it is good to see each of you out. Uh, I wanna, I'm going to begin by saying that uh, fatherhood um, is probably one of the, the things in my life that has caused the most emotion. Um, I remember, uh, you know, as my daughter will soon be 29, um, I, I hate to say that because she might be listening, but, um, uh, but you know, I, I remember the day that my daughter was born, and I, I remember being there uh, as my baby girl was born, and I remember that at that moment I was filled with such emotion of happiness, but the other emotion I felt was like, oh my God, what am I going to do now? I'm a dad. Some of you guys, you've been there with me, okay? Uh, and so it was like all of a sudden, all this responsibility came to the realization that now uh, not only was it just me and my wife, but rather there was another person whom I had the responsibility of overseeing, of, of raising, of taking care of. And then when my son was born, I, you know, it was a double emotion uh, uh, Well, as well as that. I figured, I, hey, I'd gotten four years in before Hunter came along. I figured I learned a little bit, and then I realized that uh, I really didn't know anything, you know, because parenting girls and parenting boys are totally opposite. Am I right? You know, can I, is anybody in here this morning? Amen? You know what I'm saying? It's really, uh, you know, so, uh, you know, as we think about that, fatherhood is a mixture of emotions, responsibilities, and pressure. And uh, I know that mothers would argue that fathers get away easy, <laughs> excuse me, uh, when it comes to being a parent. Uh, the, the man may say that the, the you know, the, they, they would say that the man doesn't have any clue about the pressures of being a, a parent because they don't have to carry a child for nine months. Uh, the birthing of the child and the physiological changes that a woman goes through could never un be understood by a father. Let me tell you what we did. <clears throat> I don't know if they still do this or not, but uh, you know, as men and women go through uh, child, you know, the, the time of expectancy of a child, we went through uh, classes 
on like how to how to have a baby. You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm talking about, right? Lamaze classes, right? And I, re- <clears throat> so I remember this one time because I was always, I, I like comedy, okay? I like things. And so when Kathy was getting pretty well along with Sierra, you know, and she was having trouble getting up out of the chair or getting out of bed, I would laugh at her, you know, and uh, under my breath. Uh, I would, because <laughs> she's got a mean left hook, okay? But uh, I would, I would kind of snicker, and then at one of these Lamaze classes, they put this suit on us guys that was, um, it was weighted, okay, in certain areas. It was weighted, and uh, they had us lay down on this table and then try to get up, try to sit up. I had a completely different appreciation for my wife after that, okay? Uh, she was like, she was standing there, come on, come on, sit up, sit up. And I'm like, I can't, you know? And so anyway, uh, but so the woman would say that the father kind of gets off easy. And you know what? I, I think in reality we do. Uh, but men notoriously um, uh, struggle with the pressure of raising a child and, uh, you know, making sure that the family is taken care of and things like that. And so I would concur that those particular things cannot ever be comprehended uh, by a father, okay? Um, However, there are tremendous weights that are also carried by a father that may not be realized by a mother. And uh, we're not going to go and start an argument over who's more important, because the reality is both the father and the mother are so very, very important when it comes to the rearing and the raising and the discipling and all of those different processes of bringing forth a child into our world. And so we're going to do that today. You ladies had your day back in May, so we're going to kind of give this one to the dads, all right, and to the guys here today. So just, you ladies, just sit back and just uh, just give me an amen every once in a while, okay? (laughs) Let me know you're here, all right? But uh, we're going to talk about uh, fatherhood. I want to begin this morning by reading a passage of Scripture in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 11 and 12. Now, this is Paul uh, speaking to the church in Thessalonica, and he says here in verses 11 and 12, For you know that we dealt with each of you as a father deals with his own children, encouraging comforting and urging you to live lives worthy of God who calls you into his kingdom and his glory. I want to say that out of those two verses, Paul defines the role of a godly father. And there are some key elements just in those two verses that we're going to break down this morning, but we're going to look in some other passages of scripture as well uh, about what it means to be a godly father. And, uh, you know, as here's the thing I've realized, is that guys, no matter where we are in the raising of our children and, 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 the, and being a husband and a father and all those kinds of things, it's still a learning process. Am I right? It's still something that we're still doing, uh, what I call OJT, on-the-job training, okay? Uh, it's kind of learn as you go, but we're going to look at some of those things this morning. So Paul says that there are uh, some things that he taught the church in Thessalonica that would be very continuous or a con- like a continuum to uh, the way that a father deals with the children, and that is encouraging, comforting, and urging Okay, so we're going to look at those, those three perspectives this morning uh, as we break down. So the number one in your notes here on the back of your bulletin there, number one, the, the, the effects of, of a godly father is this, that the godly father encourages his children. A godly father encourages his children. Over in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 4, uh, Paul again writes here as he says this, Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and the instruction of the Lord. I'm going to be honest that in this particular day and age where we're living, I find that a lot of guys are getting, getting in this wrong. And let me explain why. A few years ago, uh, I went over to the Fruitland Falcons Stadium to watch a you know, 
football game, a little, little teeny guy's football, Falcons football. And I watched this eight-year-old kid uh, come off the field and, uh, and was so excited that he had made a, a tackle uh, against the opposite f- team. And he, he came over and, and his dad was there and, uh, and his, he was going like this and, and his dad just kind of did one of these things. And so I, I thought, that's kind of odd. So I stood around at, until the after, end of the game and, and uh, the, the, the game was over and the, the kid came over to his dad and, and the dad grabbed this kid by his shoulder pads and was telling him everything he did wrong in that game and i thought about that this week as i as paul talks about how a father encourages his children and what i see is is that a father in our world today uh in many cases is not so encouraging anymore it's all about the pressure uh, I see it on the ball field, at the baseball field, and you know all the men are standing back there in the stands, going, "Ah, come on, you got to swing harder, throw." Here's the, the thing, okay? For those of you who are baseball people, and we we are baseball people, okay? How many times have you ever gone to a to a game and you heard a parent say, "Just throw a strike," okay? You with me? Now, in my mind, I'm saying. Yeah, you know what? You're right. Your kid is out there intentionally throwing a ball. I mean, like, come on, that's like, uh, just, re- re- it that doesn't even make sense. The kid is trying his best, and everybody's going, throw a strike, throw a strike. And I bet they want to go, I'm trying, will you shut up? You know what I mean? But that's, I mean, that's what we kind of get. And, and so the godly father encourages his children. And it says, do not exasperate your children, Paul says, or do not bring them to anger or frustration, but rather encourage them. Bring them up in the training and the instruction of the Lord. As we look at this, too many fathers, while wanting better for their children, often put expectations that are so very high that the child will never be able to fulfill them. And I thought how sad it is that at a very young, impressionable age, uh, us fathers uh, many times are guilty of not lifting up or encouraging, but rather depicting all the intricate details of what was done wrong. And so I learned a long time ago, um, because at one time I was just as guilty as everybody, when Hunter was playing ball, it was like, you know, come on, you got to do this, you got to do that. And then finally, um, my wife said to me, you know what? Your son needs a dad. You're not his coach. And I thought, wow. You know? And so whenever my son or my daughter do things now, I, I try my hardest to find the good in something and encourage them because I have seen the effect of what it feels like to always be criticized for not being able to accomplish what was expected of you. I am a product of what that looks like. Always trying to please people now, always trying to, be, to get people's acceptance because all through my life I was told how bad or how, how, how I couldn't live up to what the expectations were. Paul says that a godly father encourages his children. He, we all want our children to have a better life than we did. But there's a way of showing that without placing so high of expectations on them that they are never, never able to accomplish it. And so the godly father encourages. You know, my son is uh, going to be 25 next week. And, uh, and there are times when he'll call me and he's like, hey, you know, um, didn't, <laughs> you know, kind of go like this. I had a bad day at the office. You know, what he really means, I had a bad day on the mound. And, uh, and I, you know, and, I, and he'll talk to me and I'm like, but you did this right, you know, but you did that, you know. Uh, you know, when you're, we've got to be the ones, uh, the godly father's got to be the ones that looks outside of all the areas of mistakes and encourage 
those to keep going. You know what I mean? So the godly father uh, encourages his children. Number two, um, we find that the godly father comforts his children. The godly father comforts his children. Now, let me say that this is kind of new in our culture, and I'll explain. Most of us, as I look around today, <clears throat> probably grew up with a father who worked very long hours, right? And, uh, and probably didn't make all your games, you know, um, and all those different things. And so when we find here that the godly father comforts his children, I grew up in a household, and again, I, I'm not looking for a pity party. I'm just I'm stating the obvious, the facts, that I grew up in a house where my father um, was not the comforting person in our household, okay? And so, you know, I grew up in a household where the words, I love you, were not spoken as often as they should have been in my mind, because in his mind, I was supposed to know that, okay? So the reason I was supposed to know that is dad would always say, I get up and go to work every morning. I put food on your table. I put clothes on your, uh, you know, and so that in his way was the words, I love you. But what he failed to recognize until very, very late in his life was that what I was longing for, I didn't want that other stuff. I didn't care about that other stuff. All I wanted to hear was, I love you and I'm proud of you. And so a godly father comforts his children. Over in Luke chapter 15, uh, most of you probably already know this passage of Scripture. It's talking about, Jesus is here talking about the prodigal son. And I want to begin by looking this morning at verses 11 through 32. And, and I want to break down some key components here of this, uh, this, the parable here. So as we look at this, Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. And the younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. Some of you guys, you've been there? Uh, I'm with you, okay. After he had spent everything that he had, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. I'm going to tell you something, friends. I've been a pig feeder, and it ain't cute, and it ain't fun, and pigs, when they talk about pigs slopping, you better believe pigs slop, okay? And uh, so he found himself feeding pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired men have food to spare, and here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. So he got up and went to his father. Now, uh, but while he was still a long way off, mm, I love this, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead, and he's live again. He was lost, and he's now found. So they began to celebrate. Now, most people will stop there with the parable of the, of the, you know, the lost son. But I want to go on. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. And when he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him, but he answered this father like this, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. You never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours 
who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me, and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is now found. You see, in this, the, the reaction of a godly father that comforts his children, this father could have reacted a very different way than what the parable of Jesus records. He could have, been, uh, he could have acted a whole lot different to the younger son. And many of you, like myself, probably could see yourself as being the younger son in this parable. Here's, what, here's how the father could have responded. What are you doing back here? You've lost all the money that I gave you. What are you doing? You didn't think about the consequences of, what, of your actions. What are you doing? You weren't responsible. Do you see how the father could have turned this whole entire uh, setting around? But what got me the most was the way the father responded. Because, I, I, you know, I don't know about you, but I see in verse 20, the latter part of 20, that he says when he got up and went to his father, and he says that his father, while, his, while the son was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. That tells me that even though this father had given up a part of everything he had worked for all his life, and although the son had demanded his part of it, and he had given it to him, and he had gone out and done things that would not be the most beneficial, the, the wisest choice, but it told me there that the father was always looking for the return of his son. <laughs> and I thought to myself, how often is it as parents, how many nights have we sat up <laughs> and waited? My mother, uh, who seven years ago passed away this week, you know, this past week, I remember the many nights of coming in the door well past what my curfew was supposed to be. And I remember walking in the door trying to be real quiet, not turning on any lights, tiptoeing through the living room, only to hear her rocking chair squeak. And there she was. And I remember one particular night I came in and uh, I had indulged in some liquid petrol. Can I put it that way? <laughs> and I went to the, the, the bathroom uh, with uncontrollable uh, body movements. And uh, I remember falling into the tub and tearing the toilet paper hanger off the wall. And I got up the next morning, and you know, Mom never said a word. And I thought, you know, she could have acted a whole lot different. I did have to fix the toilet paper holder. Um, but anyway, this father could have acted a whole lot different than what he did. But he, encouraged, he comforted his child. He, the, God, the godly father comforted the son and welcomed him back, old, back home. Now, ironically, the older son was furious because his father had welcomed the irresponsible younger son back. But I want to focus on verse 28 through 30. Again, the older brother became angry and refused to go in, so his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you. Never disobeyed your orders. You've never given me anything, is basically what he said, so that I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours... He didn't even call him brother. Well, this son of yours, uh, who has squandered all your property with prostitutes and all that stuff, you killed a fattened calf. And then he says this, my, my son, you're always with me, and everything I have is yours. 
that, that encouragement and that comfort that, that comfort that comes from a father as he states the obvious. Yes, you know what, Billy? I don't know that they used names like Billy back in the, in the Old in the, in the Testament, but Billy, your brother Bobby really messed up. But that doesn't in any way detract from my love for him, nor does it in any way minimize the love that I have for you. A, a, a true godly father uh, comforts his children. Now, I do know that um, there are times when our child needs one or the other of, our, of the parents. Am I right? It seems like... Um, you know, guys always go to the mom, and girls always come to the father, especially when they're younger, okay? And, uh, you know, especially if it was boy problems, and all I'd say to Sierra was like, do I need to go take care of him? Do I need, you know, but like, no, daddy, I just, you know, he hurt me, you know, that whole kind of thing. And, 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 but the, the son usually goes to the mother and, and, and talks about things. And then as they get older, the roles kind of reverse a little bit. You know, they still have, you know, those things. But a, the godly father is there to listen and to comfort because that's what our heavenly father does for us. Let's be honest this morning, friends. Most of us, we are like that, that younger son. <laughs> we go off and do our own thing. We go off and make bad choices. We go off and squander uh you know uh, i i'm gonna say i i can tell you this i've never been with a prostitute okay so uh but that's what this young kid did you know but anyway here's the thing we all do that and then we go to our heavenly father and we say god man i'm really sorry dad i'm really sorry and there are times when a father has to discipline but there are most of the times when the father says we'll work on that we'll work on that so the godly father comforts his children. Now, the third thing that a godly father does, and Paul laid this out really well as he addressed the church in Thessalonica there, uh, he says this, that the godly father urges his children to live for God. The most important thing that you guys can do and you ladies can do as, as, as parents is to encourage your children to live for God. Because yes, you can inspire them to become doctors. You can inspire them to become uh, whatever it is they want to be. But the most important job that you and I have as a parent is to encourage our children to live for God. Because all that other stuff will not matter one day. All that's going to matter is whether or not our children have heard about the name of Jesus Christ and whether or not they have accepted him as their Lord and Savior. That's what's going to matter. Over in the Old Testament, in the book of Deuteronomy, in chapter 6, Moses writes these words, verses 4 through 9. And I thought this was pretty cool uh, about what you know, he says about his father. He says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, uh, it is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be upon your hearts. Now look what he says here. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands. Bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on all your gates. Moses is saying here, the most important thing that we can do as fathers and as parents is to encourage and, and uh, uh, urge our children to live for God. We teach our children through what we say. We teach our children by what we do. And there's a song and a video that I, wanna, I want you to watch for just a second because I think it speaks very, very strong volumes to what uh, Moses was referring to here. This is it. Hey, little bear. Where'd you learn that song? You, Daddy. Uh oh, you ready to go? <laughs> okay. Town 
I'm just my boy and me with a happy meal in his booster seat. Knowing that he couldn't have the toy till his nuggets were gone. A green traffic light turned straight to red. I hit my brakes and mumbled under my breath. His fries went a flying and his orange drink covered his lap. Well, in my four year old set a four letter word, it started with S, and I was concerned. So I said, Son, now where'd you learn to talk like that? He said, I've been watching you, Dad. We got back home and I went to the barn I bowed my head and I prayed real hard Said, Lord, please help me help my stupid self The nest tried a bedtime later that night Turning on my son Scooby-Doo night light he crawled out of bed and he got down on his knees. He closed his little eyes, folded his little hands, spoke to God like he was talking to a friend. And I said, son, now where'd you learn to pray like that? He said, I've been a The trouble is not in your set. <laughs> I can't hear a thing. <laughs> you see, our children learn by what they see and they hear. And uh, I, I think, you know, that riding and the spilling of the french fries I think we've all been there with our children at one time or another. And uh, like, where did you hear that? I heard it from you, Dad. Oh, my word. That's an awakening thing. But our father, a father uh, urges his children to live for God. And then finally, this morning, there's one more thing that a godly father does. And I want to put this on your notes here, that the godly father honors the mother of his children. Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 through 25. 
you would say, well, this is not really a passage for Father's Day, but I believe it is. This is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man, did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in his mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from all their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet, the virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. And when Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. But he had no union with her until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name of Jesus. Joseph loved Mary, no doubt. And the conception of a child that wasn't his gave Joseph every right to leave Mary, to kind of shun Mary. But Joseph was a godly man, and so he did what the angel had told him. He, na- he married Mary and raised the baby Jesus as his own. It was through Joseph's obedience that Jesus became known as the son of a carpenter. Too many children in our world today are being raised in homes with only a mom. The father figure is a key element to the successful rearing and raising of children today. I believe in my own heart, and this is my own opinion, that part of the catastrophe of our culture today is because there's too many absent fathers in the world. And so a godly father honors the mother of his children. The godly father recognizes this and willfully joins the mother in marriage so that the children will grow up with loving parents that will nurture them and teach them the ways of God. You see, friends, today, the godly father urges his children to live for God, and the godly father honors the mother of the child that's being conceived. And they offer that child back to God. We could go all the way back to the New Testament. We find there that, you know, uh, God made it so that man and woman would come together and procreate the world and, and be, be uh, fruitful and multiply. Sadly, in our world today, that is being taken uh, not in a perspective that it was intended to be, And there are too many children in our world who do not know their father or do not spend time with their father. And we we fail uh, as a culture to recognize the importance of a father figure in a child's life. It is very important that a godly father honors the mother of his children. I know that we're living in a world where 51% of our marriages fail, probably even more than that right now. And if, maybe you've been there. Maybe you've had that. But then what's most important is, is that as a father and a mother, we recognize the importance of each other and to be there for the child. And a godly father honors the mother. So I hope today that you've had an opportunity, guys, uh, you know, usually Father's Day sermons are about blasting the dads for all they do wrong, and I don't want to do that. You know, I want to encourage us. Yeah, we do, we do some stuff, we, you know, our wives shake their heads sometimes and go, what in the world did I marry? But you know what? Uh, At the end of the day, we're trying. Still got a long way to go. But uh, I just want to con- congratulate you fathers today, congratulate you guys, and recognize you, and, uh, and say happy Father's Day to you. So, with all that being said, is there anything else anybody wants to do- talk about today? Let's have a wedding. A wedding? A wedding. Really?
Already. <laughs> so we have <laughs> you said anywhere anytime and you got a new shirt man <laughs> so we've been pra- praying and planning this for a while and I'm hoping he's going to say yes <laughs> yes, you're right. It really would. So we have been planning. We've been planning today uh, behind Mikey's behind Mikey's uh, back for for a special occasion. Um, and I, I'm going to tell you, I love these guys. And uh, Mikey, you said this anywhere, anytime. I think so. <laughs> <laughs> and so your fiance went out and got the marriage license without you knowing it. I got him in my office. She's got, <laughs> she's got it all planned out, man. So why don't you come on up here with me? <laughs> <laughs> do you need do you yeah do you do you need us to push pause like on the live feed and everything or you're good come over here on this side brother i'm gonna say congratulations already okay <laughs> all right well let's have our uh let's have our entrance if you can Why don't you guys come right on up here, and then I'm going to walk down. How's that? You guys ready? (laughs) (laughs) Jonah, why don't you come over here by your daddy, okay? And it's it it really is okay if you guys get close together, okay? Dearly beloved, we are gathered together in the sight of God and in the presence of these witnesses to join together this man and this woman in holy matrimony. This is an honorable estate instituted of God and signifying unto us the mystical union which exists between between Christ and his church. It is therefore not to be entered into unadvisedly, but reverently and discreetly and in the fear of God. And into this holy estate these two persons come now to be joined. Mikey and Jennifer, I charge you both as you stand in the presence of God before whom the secrets of all hearts are disclosed, that having duly considered the holy covenant you are about to make, you do now declare before this company your pledge of faith each to the other. Be well assured that if these solemn vows are faithfully kept as God's word demands and if steadfastly you endeavor to do the will of your heavenly Father, God will bless your marriage and will grant you fulfillment in it and will establish your home in peace. Mikey, do you take this woman to be your wedded wife, to live together in the holy estate of matrimony? Will you love her, comfort her, honor and keep her in sickness and in health, and forsaking all others, keep yourself only unto her so long as you both shall live? Okay. I'm assuming that is I will. Okay, yes. <laughs> Jennifer, will you take this man to be your wedded husband, to live together in the holy estate of matrimony? Will you love him, comfort him, honor and keep him in sickness and in health, and forsaking all others, keep yourself only unto him so long as you both shall live? And so, Jonah and Jackson, this is for you, okay? Who, 
who gives this woman to be married to this man? And you both say, I, we will. We will, Jackson, we will, right? Okay, all right. So, Mikey, you got the hands of your, your bride here. And I want you to repeat after me, okay? Not yet, not yet. We're not putting the rings on yet, okay? <laughs> Hold on, Jen. Hold on, Jen. I, Mikey, take you, Jennifer. To be my wedded wife. To have and to hold. From this day forward. For better, for worse. For richer and poorer. In sickness and in health. To love and to cherish. Till death does part. And according to God's holy law, I pledge you my faith. I pledge you my faith. All right. All right, Jen, now you're going to repeat after me. I, Jennifer, take you, Mikey. I, Jennifer, take you, Mikey. To be my wedded husband. To be my wedded husband. To have and to hold. To have and to hold. From this day forward. From this day forward. For better, for worse. For better, for worse. For richer, for poorer. For richer, for poorer. In sickness and in health. In sickness and in health. To love and to cherish. To love and to cherish. Till death do us part. Till death do us part. According to God's holy law. According to God's holy law. And there too. I pledge you my faith. All right. Now let me have the rings. So Mikey and Jennifer have chosen the wedding ring as a symbol uh, that will be known for all of the world. That as they put these on, what's amazing to me about the, the wedding ring is as you look at it, it is a complete circle. And the craftsman who created it did so so intricately that you cannot tell where it started and where it ends. It's just a continuum. It goes round and round and round. So Mikey and Jennifer, as you take these rings, remember that every time there are those days that you're not going to like each other. But I want you, when that happens, I want you to look at this ring and said to all eternity, to the moon and back. So, Mikey, take this ring and place this on the ring finger of your, your bride and repeat after me. This ring I give you in token and pledge of our constant faith and abiding love. Okay, Jen. This ring I give you in token and pledge of our constant faith and abiding love. Let's pray. Father, we come to you right now and uh, we are so joyful to be able to spend this precious moment in all the expanse of eternity, God. This moment you have brought these two people and us as witnesses to this special occasion when they commit to each other the vows of marriage and matrimony and the, the, the faith and the vow to love each other until the end of time. God, we ask you to bless them. We ask you to guide them and direct them. Allow their love to continue to be for each other as you have intended for marriage to be. And God, for the future, as we know that they will be having a child, we know, Lord, that uh, we're going to ask you to bless them, uh, bless their comings and goings, and we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. For as much as Mikey and Jennifer have consented together in holy wedlock and have witnessed the same before God and this company and thereto have pledged their faith each to the other and have declared the same by the joining of hands, I now pronounce that they are husband and wife together in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, those whom God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. Mikey, you may kiss your bride. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it is my esteemed honor to present to you Mr. and Mrs. Mikey Hogan. <laughs> You got me. (laughs) 
Ladies and gentlemen, that concludes our service for today. We thank you for joining us. Thank you for being a part of this special occasion. And uh, for those of you who are on site, uh, you're now welcome to join us in our fellowship hall as there's a dinner prepared and uh, we'll spend some time celebrating with Mikey and Jennifer. Thank you. God bless.